realized that what began in the alleys and back ways of this quiet town would end in the badlands of Montana. Why am I here? Because it's the prom. Why am I here with you? Because I asked you. Having a party. Oh, geez. I love a party. Oh, me too. <laughs> I saw, where's it at? Where's what at? You're a party. I'm not having a party. I thought you were having a party. I am? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Look at all that brown swagger. Oh, yeah, it's a lot of brown swagger. It's uh, for my dad, uh, for his, his trip. Uh, my dad, he's going to uh, Wisconsin. I asked him how he's uh, going to get there, uh, but he uh, won't say nothing. Wisconsin, that is a real party state. Yeah. I hate a Braun a Schweizer. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Let me take your coat. Oh. How's your cold? Oh, I'm miserable. You're like crap. Oh, well, that's nice, honey. Odessa walked to work today. Oh, you told us you had to? In the rain, mm. from Cobb Street. But she's not walking again. No? No. You have your job, and I guess you do it just fine. My job is to run this house, and as long as it's clean, supper's cooked, and the laundry gets done, I don't... I don't think it's any of your business how it happens. Wait a second. Aren't you forgetting who pays the bills around here? Well, then, what time should I be ready tomorrow? Ready for what? Well, I'm going to go downtown with you in the morning and help you with your job. You seem so intent on helping me with mine. Or if you don't like that idea, I do have a college education, so I'll just go out and get a job of my own. It'll probably be something secretarial, but I'm sure I'll manage. You will have to take on a lot of the housework, which will include finding a maid who can get out here. But the money I earn will be my own, and I'll do with it what I damn well please. You're serious? And that includes giving it all to that Reverend King and the Montgomery Improvement Association so they can put an end to this whole boycott mess. Ladies and gentlemen, the first lady of country music, the coal miner's daughter, Miss Loretta Lynn. Well, I was born the coal miner's daughter In a cabin on a hill in Butcher Holler We were poor, but we had love that's the one thing my daddy made sure of. He shoveled coal to make a poor man's dollar. Daddy loved and raised eight kids on the miner's pay. Mommy scrubbed our clothes on a washboard every day. Well, I've seen her fingers bleed to complain there was no need should smile and mommy's understanding way in the summertime we didn't have shoes to wear but in the winter time 
would all get a brand new pair from a mail order catalog money made from selling a hog daddy always managed to get the money somewhere yeah Please help me welcome our friend and neighbor, Sissy Spacek. Thank you. So, that I got this part of this character who 
we had a, a, a stutter, and I was so excited, and I couldn't understand why I was But it was a wonderful thing, because I got to be with this, it was a real person, and I got to, to spend about a week with her before, and I gave myself headaches trying to beg him. By the time the film was over, everybody was seven. <laughs> but I would go, we would walk around town together, and, and I just got it. I, I remember the day I got it, and I said to the producer, you can send her home. I'm fine, I got it. She wasn't gone an hour. I couldn't do it. I couldn't get her back! <laughs> so it's great when you're playing someone that really exists. Because <laughs> you can and you had to wear those big fake teeth. I got to wear teeth. I mean, that's yes. make it hard to speak when you have to wear something like that. Well, it reminded me to stutter. <laughs> it reminded me to stutter, but she didn't know. I didn't want her to know that that I was wearing prosthetic teeth uh -huh, because I didn't want to hurt her feelings. So she, we'd go around and we'd stop at the Dairy Queen and we'd stop at all these places and have lunch and meals and. I was, I was eating with these prosthetic teeth in my mouth. I even had a prosthetic palate and little plumpers and things. And, and I broke so many of the teeth and I kept calling the, the makeup artist in Los Angeles to send more teeth. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> They give me a cue line and you go, boing. <laughs> so that's that's happened before, and people think you're very bizarre because they have usually it's seamless. No one ever knows. <laughs> just like I'm very strange. <laughs> Although your you, your husband must hear certain lines and go, oh yeah, I don't oh know yeah, I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been a calling and a calling. That's what we use a lot around the house. <laughs> I don't know if they can. Well, I'll just take this opportunity while Janet is to thank all of you for coming tonight and supporting the Thomas Jefferson Center. Retired, or was it just well, she was. She, I think she was somehow challenged, but um, just an amazing, darling, funny woman who I just adored. Do you, do you find that okay? You, you played someone who was um, who shot her husband. And it's all different kinds of things. Just, just. just do you find That's why I tried not to bring home. <laughs> <laughs> We're safe, Jack. <laughs> It's easy to understand other people because they yes, I've been I've inhabited that skin for a while. I think I know what that's like. You know, I I think I'm fascinated by people. I, I'm a people watcher. I've always been fascinated by um, by people. I, I reality TV is true <laughs> because I just love to see. I love you know I'm. I'm a people watcher, and um, I think that I'm more interested in how different people do the same things. You know, what's 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 your routine in the morning? How do you brush your teeth? How do you fry an egg? You know, it's those those kinds of things. How do you move across the room? What do you? All those little details about. People, I'm, I'm stealing from people all the time. <laughs> you feel like a magpie. I yeah. do. I'm taking yeah. things that I see from people all the time. I think most 
actors do. This this town is filled with wonderful actors. Oh, the downtown uh, wall. Have performed on the stage. The downtown wall, that would give you, yeah. you know, food for thought for all of I feel for other actors, too. <laughs> we'll keep it up, because whatever you're doing, it's working very well. I was wondering, when you were a kid, I guess all kids have, you know, pretend, but I just wonder if you pretended more than others. Remember on Saturday Night Live, Gilda Radner would she wear the brownie uniform and jump on the bed and, she, and, um, and says the Judy Miller show. <laughs> what do you mean, the Sissy Space Egg show? Well, my mother always said to me as a kid, and I never thought about being an actress when I was young, but she always said, oh, you're so dramatic, you should be an actress. I don't think she meant it in that way. I think it was just a wrong way. But, you know, it's the funniest thing. I was the third of three children. And by the time I came along, you know, things were going, were pretty chaotic. And I would come home in first grade and say, Mom, I have, I'm supposed to read to you. And she'd say, well, sissy, she'd be frying chicken. <laughs> Why don't you go into my room and sit in front of the mirror and read to yourself? <laughs> I think that's what it's really like. I would like her. I would like her. I mean, later on, sing to myself. I had twins who kind of grew up the same way. That's very funny. <laughs> You never know. Watch out, parents. Yeah, I would, I would put the petticoat on my head to be a bride. And for Catholic kids, it's nothing like neck wafers because those are your communion. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so did you did you kind of live inside your head or, or did, uh, more, or did you play with other kids? Did you run with scissors? <laughs> I, I had brothers who, I, you know, I always wanted to be a boy. And uh, like my brothers, you're and, a huge failure. <laughs> uh, you know, I had a wonderful childhood. Um, I just, I you know, climbed trees and played touch football with my brothers and usually got clobbered and, you know, just had a very uh, rural country life. Okay. Nothing that would have nothing, predicted this. Nothing that would have. Well, um, whenever I attempt to write fiction and I create a character, even if it's someone who's just awful, morally reprehensible. If I want to create a character that's three-dimensional, I find I have to love that character. Um, not, not accept everything the person does, but I have to love that person in order to generate what that person would do. And, and I'm wondering if, like, I think of Ruth Fowler in, in the bedroom, and that last scene where she goes, did you do it? That was just so. That was just so chilling. Yes. Yeah. Did you? Were you able to, to, to love and ex not accept what she did, but to love her or that kind of character? You know, I think for me, more than loving a character. Now, I'm going to try that because I. Uh, oh, well, this one I haven't. But I'll take most, a of you next to Kelly. Most Ward. of the characters, I I just want to understand them, and. Um, the greatest thing about acting is you, your, your life. You know, your your school really is 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 life. You're taking from life, and and the most important thing for me in that film was to understand how a, a mother loves her children, and um, that I I understand. So that made me understand. It's 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 a um, it's an interesting thing to go to those places and find those places in yourself. In yourself, yeah. It's kind of scary. Yes, I to find old really scary. There, there is a place there. <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought that fiction writing is just a hair's breadth away from mental illness because you know, it's all you know living in a dream world. Would you say that's true for? Probably, probably, maybe more because, I, oh, I don't know, I'm, ask my friends. <laughs> I don't know, I've never thought of myself as, you know, I've thought of myself as pretty, you know, straight up. Or maybe that you're own thing. The thing I love, though, is that, you know, you, you use things from your own life, and there have been times in my life, usually when I was younger, you know, in a hysterical moment, and, you're, and you think, don't forget this. 
What's up? So you're watching yourself in the corner. Breaking out. I'm thinking, okay, I can use this for the adult that have this big house. So it's like building up your inventory. It's kind of a, you know, uh, a protective mechanism that, you know, always remembers. So the answer is yes. <laughs> Again, with Ruth Fowler, um, if you're not the type, you don't strike me as the type that gets mad very often. I don't know, you have a very gentle way about you. And I wonder, you had to summon up that kind of compressed anger that Ruth felt. And I wonder if after you portrayed her, if you found that your, your mind sort of knew the way, if it was easier for you to express anger. Oh, I'm anger. just mad all the time. <laughs> Actually, anger was, has always been a difficult, uh, emotion for me, one that I'm less familiar with, but unfortunately now I'm really, <laughs> you got it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it gives you a larger repertoire in your own, of emotions. In your own life. Um, that is, that's always been one that, that's been difficult for me. Anger, that's good. Yeah. Well, your husband's life and then your children, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and I saw one of the movies I saw was Night Mother, which I thought was just stunning. Absolutely stunning. And it must drive you crazy when things don't go over well at the box office. You no, know, it doesn't at all because I learned early, early on in my career, I made a film called Badlands that I think is just a, a yeah. wonderful <laughs> and, and it's, uh, you know, Terrence Malick, just brilliant. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, when this film comes out, I'm going to have to keep a big stick by the door. <laughs> Because people are just gonna go crazy. You're gonna love it so much. And you know what? I, it, it was a critically acclaimed, but it really didn't do. You know, it didn't. It, I didn't need the stick. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, you know, that was a really wonderful thing for me because I thought if that wonderful film, you know, was didn't go gangbusters at the box office. That's not the way to judge uh, the success of a film. So I, I try to just do my work, and then when I finish, when I'm wrapped on the set, it's over for me. And then, then, and then whatever happens happens. The experience for me, you know, is is done, and uh, I put that film to bed. And if it if it does well, that's great, or if it turns out to be a good film, that's great, that's icing on the cake, but um, it would be just too difficult to, to, you know, to to depend on things that you can't control. I guess that keeps you seeing it. So you are seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wondering, in Night Mother, it was, you played someone who was depressed, obviously, because she shoots herself in the end. Um, yeah, I my husband. Yeah, I know. This, oh, this is, Thread running through this. Um, I, the movie was so wonderful. By the end, I had it was gagging on a lump in my throat. It was just so moving and wonderful. Anne Bancroft was fantastic. But I was wondering, what must it be like for you to play someone who's depressed for however long it takes to make the movie? Well, I was so ready to shoot myself. I tell you, <laughs> we shot in sequence, and which is very rare on a film. And you know, each day we just you know, get a little bit closer and a little bit closer. And we were shooting this big, dark sound stage. And my oldest daughter was my only daughter at that point. She was about three, and she was in Virginia, and I was in Los Angeles in this dark sound stage. And I remember one day, this, the door opened at the end of the sound stage, and some light came in, like a stream of light. And this little red-headed three-year-old came in, and everyone in the and the whole sound stage, because we'd been shut in there for about two months, went, oh, oh. So it was, it was, it, that was hard, but I was really depressed. <laughs> yeah. So it is hard. I, I recovered. Yes. <laughs> it must be hard at the end when you're done shooting for the day to, to find your happy place again. <laughs> well, you know, some, some uh, characters you, you bring home, most of them, you do, and I, Jack always laughs, and you know, there were a lot of characters he liked better than other ones. You know, some of them were a little more difficult to live with. There weren't even any you liked better than me, I hope. It's like, so could you, could I you don't be think I'll come on, on set for that one, Sissy. <laughs> Just run along. If he asked you to start 
being another character <laughs> in <their> trouble. <laughs> but in the other end of the spectrum, in Crimes in the Heart, which is 1986, Jessica Lange and Diane Keaton, Sam Shepard, there was a laughing scene in that that was just brilliant. Um, uh, you and Diane Keaton have to tell Jessica Lange that your grandfather has lapsed into an irreversible coma. It's bummer of a piece of news to have to get. And, and they all just start laughing. And laughing's hard to fake. I mean, did, I mean, what I was wondering was like, how long did it take to film that? Did you laugh all day? Did we you laughed laugh all week. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I had a very high fever, uh, very high fever. So I was, I was actually having an out-body experience. I was, I remember, I was sort of up in the corner of the kitchen, <laughs> near the ceiling, uh, watching us laugh. And we were hysterical. <laughs> It must, I mean, is it, I, I wonder, for no, if you're, you have to laugh, and how do you, is it just an ensemble thing where you're able to bring that out of each other? Well, I was sick. I had the high fever, and that took care of me. And I, I, you know, we, we all really enjoyed each other, so. Yeah. I guess we needed a good laugh. You just did it. Now, speaking of Badlands, 1973, I sat down to watch that, not having known that it was true story of these two people that were on the, on the run and killed all these people. I didn't know. And it just starts off with, you know, it's just, you're supposed to be like 13 or something. And how old were you when you did that? You know, I don't remember, but I was supposed to be 13. I was 20, 21, something like that. 21. Yeah, we played, <laughs> we played 13 to 14 real good. <laughs> and just, you know, ordinary little girl. I just, I just like, sat on the edge of my seat. You know, that was my, uh, I twirled in that. Who knew that I would be able to use that talent? <laughs> and I did my high school majorette routine that I tried out for majorette. Is that right? Would you bring on the baton, please? <laughs> <laughs> we can use it to redo. Terrible. That came out in 
Anyway, go ahead. Well, I had a hell of a time getting a copy of this. I ended up, I went on the internet and, and bought a copy so you could see it at my house. It'd be nice. To go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, it's interesting because to see, as we know from um, Cole Miner's daughter, has a, a daughter has a lovely voice. In the role of Verna, USO girl, she had to be uh, a young girl who was recruited for this three person USO show. And she can't sing, she can't dance, but this is her. I wonder what it was like for you as a singer to have to sing badly. Well, they just put everything in that key that I couldn't even get to. The, the funniest part of the story, though, is that we made this movie, we made it for PBS. It was really wonderful. It was William Hurt's very first and a fine looking Nordic god he was. <laughs> Yes, he was. But, um, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> I do remember that there was one shot that was like a mass of a thousand GIs and Bills in the middle. And really, you could only see Bill. <laughs> he was very, he had a great uh, presence on. Um, and that was his first um, film. First, first film. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know what the story was. I was going to tell. The, the director of that's name is Ron Maxwell, and he. It was his very first uh, film. He was actually in film school at NYU Film School, Zone, and he was giving interviews after we did this this um, little little show, and he was telling everyone, and this was. In particular, it was an interview he did with the world who saw magazine. He said, I sing. I was perfect for the role. I couldn't sing. Well, I think that's probably the <laughs> <laughs> That was horrible. I mean, it was just great acting. <laughs> well, I was bad singing. I was watching that again um, yesterday. It did hurt my feelings. <laughs> well, I put it on because I was trying to remember the, 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 the scene that is my favorite. Sissy's face I've seen, and that's saying something, I've seen a lot of them, and it's, um, uh, she, she's very frightened anyway because it's a USO show and there's bombs bursting in air and it's not easy, but then it gets worse and worse and worse until they're in a basement, and Verna, Sissy, is in a it's catatonic in a fetal position in the corner, and they ask, that there are GIs down, stuck down there with her too, and they ask him to put on a show, where she could hardly speak the whole of the show. And you put on the little bunny costume. Oh, that was cute. Oh, that was so, so cute. Um, and there's a point where you're standing there, just in the fright in your face. It was so, it was so believable. It didn't look like acting at all. And then you said the first couple of lines, the devil is in your heart. And you could hardly sing. And then there was no band because there was no band stuck in the cellar with them. And all the GIs in the audience started to hum it to help you. And they're going, and, you just, and they all just their hearts. And you were feeding off of that <laughs> and, and slowly transformed. And there was nobody home yesterday, and I just let it rip. And I was just, the tears were sliding down my face. That is my favorite, favorite scene. <laughs> Thank you. Is that so long ago that it's hard for you to remember filming? I have no recollection of this. Either. <laughs> And I 
I remember watching 12 and 13 year old girls at the time and they never walked anywhere. They would run from one place to the other. So I did that, you know, so a lot of it was body language. And I kind of raised my voice a little bit, the pitch of my voice, and as I aged, I, my voice got a little lower. And I wore, I, you know, I ate a little more. And they kind of <laughs> helped me out with <laughs> the costumes. Um, oh, it took them hours to make me look 40. <laughs> And enough of the, the movie that I would say was the most hypnotically engaging was Three Women, the Robert Altman uh, movie. And I put it on at like 10 or 11 at night, thinking I'll watch half of it the next half. And I, like one in the morning, I'm still like, listen, I'm, I, I, it's DVD, and so you can do the commentary part. And I'm watching everything having to do with this movie. My favorite scene is when you sit down at a bar and you're playing a very young girl, and maybe even in braids and you down an entire pitcher of beer. That was wicked impressive. And how did you do it, and was it real beer? <laughs> it was real beer. <laughs> and we had to do it a couple of times, if I remember correctly. It was a huge pitcher of beer. And I was feeling no pain. <laughs> and I actually then did a scene where, it, where I fall through some saloon doors backwards, and I broke my tailbone because I was really smashed. <laughs> I, I think there was another scene I, on that. I don't know why we were using real beer. And I did a scene where I was smoking cigarettes, and I got sick from smoking, and so we had to reshoot it with me chewing gum instead, <laughs> which was much better. I learned a great lesson. So was it very different working with Robert Altman compared to other directors? He's wonderful to work with, and it is very different working with him. We, with him, we had an outline for the for the uh, script, and each day when we finished the scenes, the script supervisor would hand us the scene all typed up. Um, and so at the end of the, when we finished the film, we had a finished script. <laughs> That's not usually the way it works. <laughs> Quite an adventure. Our time is running out here. Um, the other night, um, I sat down with my husband and daughter Jill, and um, we watched Blast from the Past, and it was such fun. I had, I had no idea. I, I missed this when it came out, and um, and you were great. And that's your first comedy, isn't it? Well, I've been very funny in some dramas, but. Uh, <laughs> It's, 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 if you consider Crimes of the Heart a comedy. Well, yes, yes, yes. Um, Southern Gothic. So, yeah, I guess it was. Would you like to do more comedy? Yeah. I would, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you know anybody, <laughs> we could network the crowd. <laughs> well, one more question is, you have worked with some amazing leading men, Jack Lemmon, Eric Roberts, Kevin Costner, Christopher Walken, uh, Martin Sheen, Mel Gibson, Tommy Lee Jones. I wonder, I wonder if you have a favorite or a most memorable. <laughs> you know, I was crazy about all of them because uh, when you're working on a project with someone and, and, and the right actors are cast, it's really magic. And, you know, no one in the world could have played Doolittle Lynn but Tommy Lee Jones. And, no one but Martin Sheen could have been Kit Brothers in Badlands. And so, you know, they were just wonderful all to work with. I really loved working with Tommy Lee. He was just intense and wonderful. We had a really wonderful working relationship. And he could have just. <laughs> I, I, re I, I have great respect for him. Um, we did a scene in Coal Miner's Daughter where he's driving a bulldozer down a mountain through the woods where he's, you know, going between little trees. And he's got pages and pages of dialogue while he's driving this 
bulldozer. And all I say is, you know, I grunt every now and then and go, uh-huh, uh-uh. And I'm perched on the side and I, I'm just, a, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm humbled by, by scenes like that. You know, people driving bulldozers, riding wild horses. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I felt. Like I love them all. <laughs> that's what I felt watching you in all these movies. She was like, I do have a great Chris Walker story, but I'm is he creepy? Not at all. He's white. He's wonderful. He always plays a creepy character in Saturday Night Live. They're in, I don't know, most of you probably didn't see Blast from the Past, but we are a couple who moved down into a bomb shelter, and we stay there. We moved there when, into the bomb shelter when we were very young, and we get very old. We stay in there a really long years. time, 35 years. And so we both aged, and we wore, we had the most fabulous age makeup, you know, prosthetics and gray hair, and he, particularly bird seed, and it was wonderful. <laughs> and he was, he was amazing. He looked amazing. And he's a very handsome man, and he was a very handsome older man, too. But one day, we were both in our age makeup, and I was in my trailer having lunch because it was, you know, I just didn't want to really walk around like that. <laughs> and I saw Chris out the window. He was walking back from having had lunch. And a really cute girl was walking along the sidewalk and passing. And he kind of smiled at her and said something. She was like, oh, oh. <laughs> and I witnessed it. God, I was just so sorry. <laughs> I'll never forget. <laughs> It was, it was, and Jack dug the hole. As the director. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> on that note, it's your turn. Marriage built on trust. <laughs> I get it. So were you, I mean, totally under the dirt? You just do this? Well, I, I was really, a, I think they had plywood on top of me. Oh, I was in a little hole. Not too far. I had never seen Carrie before. before. I but I do all my own um, stills and handwork. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have my own <laughs>
wonderful, it was a wonderful um, project and we had, it was developed by um, a, a director who was directing for his first time and after the first week um, he was, he was fired and then part of the movie was parts, some of the actors were recast. Uh, and so that was, um, it was a, it was, it was kind of tough going for a long time, and um, but it was a really great experience. Whoopi was wonderful to work with, and uh, you know we all cared deeply about it. I think it, it came out, oh, it came out well. And your transformation was interesting to watch because it was reflected in your wardrobe. You started out with a stick big skirt and silk and hair, and just gradually got yeah more to it. My skirts got straighter yes. and my hair got tighter. That's an acting. Question? Uh, Would you get that, please? Oh. Okay. Well, my favorite. 
favorite piece of architecture is the University of Virginia. And my favorite architect is Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and my favorite piece of literature is uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And uh, the reason, it, you know, when I was 12 years old, my parents took their first vacation without their children. And they came to Charlottesville, Virginia, and they brought us a frisbee from the lawn. Yes, way back then they were playing frisbee. We'd never seen a frisbee before. And they just, they brought us pictures and photographs of the university and they told us all these, uh, you know, so that, I think from then on I was fascinated with Charlottesville and <coughs> knew that it was a very special place and uh, indeed it is. And To Kill a Mockingbird was my favorite book and my favorite movie. Think uh, if there were more people like Atticus Finch in the world, mm -hmm. um, it would be a better place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's interesting too that you were in a couple of episodes of the Waltons set here, although I'm sure it was filmed in Los Angeles. But that's right, and I have, a, I have daughters named Scotter and Madison. <laughs> <laughs> child, I thought it might be Albemarle. <laughs> that would have been Ruckersville. <laughs> <laughs> he would have been. He would good. Good one. <laughs> oh, back here. Oh, is there anything you'd like to say about being a famous actress and a mother? Like, were there specific ages that you would like your daughter to watch her movies? Or was that ever scary? Really, like the first scene in Carrie. You know, it's funny that you ask because once I was, when the, um, Skylar must have been about two and a half or three, and I was running her back. And she was running around, you know, just about to get in the tub, and she didn't come, and I was calling her, and, the, you know, the water was ready, and I said, Skylar, Skylar, and, and she's, she's standing under the TV like this, and she's watching. Carrie. I couldn't believe it. It just was, you know, and she just didn't see that. And I was like, get the door. <laughs> the funniest story, though, about Carrie was um, in Texas, uh, they have, uh, what are those outdoor movie drive in theater? Drive in theater. They have a huge one right off of this big freeway in Dallas, Texas. And I am, Jack and I had just gotten picked up by my brother and his two little boys who must have been about four and six. And we we're driving down some, this expressway and we look over and it's the shower scene of oh, Carrie yeah. up on this huge And they and um, uh, and you know I, I that's 
never really been the kind of movies I make. I usually kill people. Yourself. <laughs> 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 uh, and as you pointed out, I see a pattern here. <laughs> so uh, that doesn't phase them, it's what they know. <laughs> Another question here? Last one? What will be the first thing you buy tomorrow? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.